Hey, I'm Hannah. I'm a writer and you can find everything you could possibly want to know about that linked in the description. So I will not bore you with the details. Today we're talking about how to write atmosphere. So the atmosphere is similar to the mood of a scene, but mood usually refers to the overall emotion of the whole thing. Whereas atmosphere refers specifically to the emotion of the setting of the scene. It's your settings vibes. I'll say it, it's the vibe. So understanding how to control the atmosphere of your scene can help you make your reader feel what you want them to feel. I've got five things today that might help you write atmosphere. We're gonna look at an example from one of my short stories as well as an example from one of my patrons because they're always cool enough to send me examples when I'm making a new writing video. The first thing is writing with the five senses. How boring, how basic. When you're writing atmosphere, you should definitely consider the five senses. What's it look like, sound like, smell like, taste like, feel like, but not all of them will be relevant for every single scene. You might thoroughly describe each one and then look over that to see what actually is working to accomplish your goal with that particular bit. For example, if I'm describing a swamp, there's a ton to look at, there's a ton to hear. Water splashing, frogs croaking, mosquitoes buzzing, cicadas screaming, other bugs, it's like a shit ton of bugs. It smells like a dryad corpse or a human corpse, depending on where you are. You feel the humidity. And if you're walking, you might feel twigs and bone splinters poking at your feet. Swamps are creepy. Like I said, it's very atmospherically rich. That's why I write so much about swamps. I think they're sexy and terrible. So here's the opening bit from the Swamp Witch to kind of show you what I'm talking about. Marigold leans her head against the back of her rocking chair, eyes closing the swamp buzz and raven cause. She grinds herbs in a mortar and pestle by touch. Her bare feet are stretched out on the porch, warming in the setting sunlight. A June bug flies in lazy loops, knocking gently against the shack. So her eyes are closed here. We're getting zero visual input. We hear several things. Things, the rocking chair creaking, the swamp buzz, which is bugs. Raven calls, she's feeling the um, mortar and pestle in her hand. She feels the sun on her feet. She lives here, so she wouldn't necessarily be noticing the smell right now because she's so used to it. So that's what I'm talking about when I say that we can write with every sense, but it's not necessarily gonna be relevant for your scene or in this case, for my character's perspective. This is also a pretty kind description of a swamp because Marigold lives here and she likes it. From another character perspective, it would probably sound a lot worse and we do see that later with the way that her visitors kind of interact with the setting but later in the story we do use other senses because it makes sense to do so like this part in the next scene marigold hefts the bucket to her hip and walks with the moonlight she picks her steps along a familiar path towing from low cypress knee to grass tuft to avoid sinking her feet in mud the crab's pointed legs titter against the metal bucket she sings to them when the sun beams hottest the swamp smells like old meat left to turn at night it's earthy marigold likes to take her walks in the dark we get to see how the swamp looks at night here. We hear the crab legs tittering, which I think is a fun, lighthearted word. Instead of really focusing on how the swamp smells during the day, which is gross, Marigold's taking her walk at night, so it smells less like that. We're still getting an accurate description of what it's like to live here, but Marigold likes it, so we're using positive word choices and focusing on the good things. With the crabs, they're scratching against a metal bucket, so we could describe it sounding something like nails on a chalkboard which would be gross. We could villainize the crabs and that would change the atmosphere of this scene. So what could be seen as like a scary, dangerous trek through a dark swamp is framed like a happy little midnight stroll because it's Marigold and she's insane. That's atmosphere. It's how your reader should feel about the setting. The second thing to keep in mind is how you utilize language. Word choice has a lot to do with atmosphere. Like we just read, the crab legs tittered like a laugh instead of a scraping or a dragging of fingernails. So you can describe Describe the same thing in two different ways and it might conjure the same imagery for your reader, but they'll feel differently about both of them. You'll see in most of the videos where I'm editing other people's writing, I'm changing words and I usually explain why. And it's because certain words have certain connotations. So if you're writing a spooky scene, you're gonna be using spooky verbiage to describe it. If you're writing a nice, kind, calm scene, you're gonna use words that complement that. Recently, someone sent me a story about these two guys and they're about to get abducted by aliens, so they're running away. And the scene is described effectively, but one of the words used was like bounded. And to me, that sounds like skipping, like it's fun. It's serving Tigger, and that was not the intent of the scene. The way you structure sentences can also have that effect, so pay attention to your syntax. The pacing and flow of your individual sentences can contribute to the atmosphere. We've talked about this before with like fight scenes or just action sequences. If you use short clipped sentences, the images are more likely to come in like flashes to your reader, which can make the scene seem more like fast paced and urgent. While if you're going for a more melancholy reflective bit of prose, you might use longer, slower sentences to kind of have the 
reader mows you along with you. I have a scene in the novel I'm working on right now where my character goes through this very high tense situation and then afterwards she walks through the woods. And the woods are supposed to be very comforting for her and kind of enchanting, so the sentences are a little longer and flowier. And that helps to convey that calmness that settles on after that high tension scene, which had a lot of short clipped sentences. So word choice and syntax are gonna pull a lot of weight for the atmosphere. Number four is a little like books to grammar, but hit yourself with an immersive writing experience if you can. If you're writing a scene in a cave, you might turn the lights off and put on some echoey ambiance tracks. If you're writing a scene set in public from the perspective of a socially anxious character, you might go to like a crowded coffee shop and notice things that might make a person nervous. So use like immersive playlists or scented candles or whatever to get yourself in the headspace to write for that atmosphere. I call this Momo O'Brien core. You can tell her I said that. Number five is to keep something specific in mind while you write. So I have a setting in one of my books that's like an underground cemetery type place and I have this one tombstone that I keep in mind while I'm writing it and like I know what it looks like and how the light hits it and like the moss growing on it. That's the image that comes to mind so I write that setting with that vibe. It's a good trick for keeping the atmosphere of a scene consistent. If you're not a very visual person you can also uh, establish a word or a phrase that you can associate with the atmospheric goal of your scenes and keep that in mind instead. Basically being able to conjure that image or phrase while you're writing can help to keep the atmosphere steady and you can really establish a proper vibe if you are focusing on something consistent like that. So considering all five senses and which ones would be relevant for your atmosphere, paying attention to word choice and syntax, trying to create immersive writing experiences, and keeping an image or phrase in mind while you write can all help to create a cohesive atmosphere in your scenes. Now we're going to look over an example from one of my patrons. This one's from Alec. They said that they're going for a sense of dread and loss in this prologue, so we'll read it over and then I'll give suggestions as I feel they are relevant. Prologue prints six years ago. Fires danced, slow, rhythmic, graceful. Orthus narrowed his eyes at the flames. They mocked him, crackling with delight as they wrapped around the bodies of his countrymen. Hundreds piled to mounds, burning with false pride as their corpses blackened and flaked to ash, yet the fire still danced, warm, radiant, cackling. He turned to make his way to the rallying pavilion when white flashed in his peripheral. A dozen gray, willowing figures shimmered above the flames as if molded from the smoke. With eyes like hollowed pits, they hovered in a silent ring, drinking in the morbid air. The graces. Orthus's mouth fell. Light poured through their delicate bodies as they lowered themselves into the flames, plucking souls like beads of light from the ash. Mara, at home in her garden, flashed in Orthus's mind. Would she be there now, waiting after all these years? One by one, the graces rested souls from the fall and vanishing as they claimed the last. Orthus watched in silence until a pair of hollowed eyes rested on his. A chill ran through him. Worriedly, Orthus's eyes fell to the large bundle of cloth propped against his hips, smearing dark stain over the iron scales of his armor. S soon, Orthus croaked, dipping his head and tapping three fingers above his brow in respect. The grace nodded and faded to nothing, carrying the collected souls to Nethrium where they could finally rest. Sighing as his shoulders fell, Orthus dislodged his shield from the sticking mud, hefted the bundle under his arm, and left the mass pyre to its cackling. The sun rose as he slumped across the battlefield, a pale, lifeless disc, sapped of all hope. The world seemed muted, the colors, the sounds, bled dry by the veil of smoke clouding the air. There were more corpses than grass on the slope field, and already the crows had found them, squawking as they broke their fast. As he wove his way through the clusters of soldiers sulking about the pyres, a distinct feeling of lacking, like a deep, hollow silence slithered around him. No cheers sprung up, no laughter rang out, no moans or cries the men had seen to the dying. Only the occasional clack of iron, the dragging of bodies through the mud, the cackling of the pyres, and the sweet, horrid stench of a roasting flesh. This wasn't victory. More pyres rose around him as he climbed the hill, kindled to life by the men he'd fought with and against, each bearing the deep blue colors of Thesia. Each of them his country men, and we slaughtered them. Orthus shuddered, stepping over a body. This one stared back at him, a young face, scarred and broken, too young for this kind of war. He thanked the flames he hadn't recognized the lad and continued up the hill. Okay, let's see. This is an unusual bit of feedback for me, but I think I would add the word the here, the fires danced, because if he's remembering this from six years ago, I feel like the fires would be more of a character in his memory than just an object. I don't know if that makes sense. I think I'd cut these three words too. I like the description, but I think, I don't know, something about this just isn't setting correct. That's the thing about editing prose. You just have to follow your butt. And then I think I would make this more detailed, like setting wise. It's fantasy, so your readers are ready to believe whatever you say. So if you want this to be some kind of iconic location or battle, you can just like 
name it. You know what I mean? And I think that would be a stronger opening line to this book or series. And then Orthus narrowed his eyes. If this were anywhere else in the book, I wouldn't mark it as cliched phrasing. But since this is so soon, like the first bit of your prologue, you definitely want it to not be stale at all. You want like very crisp, original prose here. So I would change that, put something more iconic. That's a great question to ask for your opening scenes. Is this as iconic as it could possibly be? I really like cackling here. It's like a little divergence because you'd expect it to say crackling because it's a fire and it's mocking him. So I think this is a characterizing observation. I think this bit about Mara is supposed to be um, comparing like the plucking souls, like she's gathering something from the garden. So I think I would expand this sentence to be more descriptive and then possibly cut this because would she be there now waiting after all these years? To me, that feels a little too direct for a prologue. I love the graces. I love their description. I might slow this down to pace it out because we've just got two sentences describing these like insane fantasy creatures. I think I would like more description of them to let that really hit and for the reader to be like, what's that? I want to be more scared of them. Um, and then we've got worriedly, Orthus's eyes fell to the large bundle of cloth. I'd have him purposely not looking at the bundle because it would be weird to like hold this and then you see like this creepy creature looking at the bundle, like you don't want to look at it too and draw more attention. So I feel like either him purposely not looking at it or him like holding it closer or something like that might be more effective there. I don't like worriedly. I think this is a bit clunky and takes away from the overall image. This is not at all an atmosphere edit, but having a character actually stutter in the dialogue is incredibly distracting, especially in a prologue when this is the only dialogue. Um, so I would just leave it at croaked. Also, I can't say for sure because I'm not positive what he's holding. I assume he's holding some kind of body and the graces are like reapers coming take the souls. So I think he should say something like not yet, maybe, if he's asking them not to take this dead person. I'm not going to marry that opinion though because I'm not exactly sure what's happening. But I think that um, some kind of sentiment other than soon might be better there. Got the sun rose as he slumped. I think I would make this two sentences. So the sun rose... He slumped across the battlefield. I think that paces it out a little better. It slows it down. And we've had a lot of the sentence structure of this as that. So that's just one fewer of those. But then I think a pale lifeless disc is referring to the sun. I think I'm gonna take that out. You could just move it over here, but I like the sun rising as kind of a contrast to how gray and smoky and dead everything is. These edits are just to my preference. Obviously, there's no right or wrong way to do anything. Okay, I love crows. There was something about this sentence I wanted to change. There were more corpses than grass on the sloped field. Sloped field to me isn't adding to the atmosphere. It isn't giving me anything interesting. It's like that could be describing anywhere. So I'm gonna take that out. And I think I'm gonna put blades of grass because blades are countable, grass isn't, and blades is also like a battle word, you know what I mean? So even if you have words that have different definition, like blades of grass is obviously not referring to swords, but it can still evoke swords. So you can do stuff like that with wordplay that's sometimes fun. There are more corpses than blades of grass and already the crows had found them squawking as they broke their fast. Ending sentences sooner than you want to usually makes them stronger. There were more corpses than blades of grass and already the crows had found them. So you could say they're squawking, but to me that's a chicken sound. Like it's not very scary. So if you leave it at just the crows had found them, the reader can conjure their own imagery. And sometimes that's better. So like, what are the crows doing? Plucking out their eyeballs, their beaks are covered in blood. And you could go in and describe that, but I think saying the crows had found them is just like foreboding and creepy enough on its own. So I really like the sentence ending like that. Sulking about, sulking to me is pouting. So it almost makes them sound petty when like, yeah, these are their friends and brothers that have died in front of them. So that seems like a bad word choice. And also verbing about is kind of playful to me. So I would change that wording for sure. I love the deep hollow silence. I like like the quiet and the smoke. I think that's great. Only the occasional clank of iron. Occasional to me is too casual of a word for this setting. So like maybe odd or intermittent or scattered. 
the scattered clank of iron, the dragging of bodies through, I would take out the, so just the dragging of bodies through mud. We've already seen the cackling pyres and crackling pyres. So I think we can take that out for now. And if you like specifically want the sound of the fire, I would just describe it in a different way. I'm gonna take out and as well. I'm gonna see if I can explain why I wanna take out and. Having such a solid list, like, this, 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 and this. To me, it feels too together. And if we're in this character's perspective, like he's taking it all in and he doesn't know when it's gonna end. So taking the and out of that list can make it seem like, oh, it's just gonna keep coming and he doesn't know when it's over, if that makes sense. Only the scattered clank of iron, the dragging of bodies through mud, the sweet horrid stench of roasting flesh. This wasn't victory. I think that hits a little harder. More pyres rose around him as he climbed the hill. Like there's nothing wrong with this sentence, but I think it could be more brutal. Like as he climbed the hill is just a little too unobstructed. And then this last paragraph, I think we could rework a lot. Orth is shuddered stepping over a body. There's nothing wrong with saying he shuddered, but that word is used very often in fiction for like a wide variety of reactions. And I think we can do a lot more specific description and a lot more, I just killed a bunch of people and I just potentially watched a lot of my friends die. I think we could do a lot more with that. Stepping over a body also. Like he could trip on it, his boot could catch on something, he could maybe step on someone and like, I don't know, some specific detail about this young soldier. This one stared back at him, a young face scarred and broken, too young for this kind of war. I might take that out. I don't hate it, but sometimes if you can be a little less direct, that's stronger. Just like replace that with gruesome detail. <laughs> he thanked the flames he hadn't recognized the lad. Again, this might be personal preference, but lad, I'm like, is he wearing suspenders? I don't know, I would say boy. And continued up the hill. This is not something I would mark anywhere else in a story, but for the last line of a prologue, you really want it to hit. So I don't know what Orthus goes on to do and I don't know what the themes are of this novel, but it could be something like, I mean, if Orthus goes on a journey after this, it could just be and climbed, you know? Like something more specific. Continued is just the vaguest word you could use there. He thanked the flames he hadn't recognized. This to me sounds really far apart. So I would wanna get much closer to the character in this, just with the phrasing. So he thanked the flames. He honestly, for some reason, didn't feels closer. He didn't recognize the boy. And we could add more description here. Like he could shift the thing he's holding as he's looking at the boy. He could close his eyelids. He could like step over him carefully. We could get more tangible, active description of Orthus interacting with this young boy instead of just thinking, oh, he's too young to be here. Like you can make it a lot more personal. Again, I don't know what the goal is for the rest of the book or what this is exactly supposed to be accomplishing, but for the last paragraph of your prologue, you want it to be really meaty. Like at least one overly excited reader needs to scream at this, you know what I mean? Overall, I think this is an effective scene. You definitely get like the sense of loss. And I think the dread comes from the basic idea of like a war not being finished and then Orthus's inner interaction um, with the graves. I really like the smoke and fire imagery, like the settling after a battle with the distinct sense that it's gonna live on in the trauma of the people who survived it. So the atmosphere is served in that way. The action of this scene, I like, like the general shape of it. I think we could strengthen the prose to really convey some strong atmosphere. I'd look at the sentence structure to give a little more attention to the flow and pacing and let some of these harrowing images kind of sit heavier in your reader's gut. I'd also be careful of word usage in a scene this dark to make sure that those dramatic beats are hitting properly. Yeah, that's all I got. Thanks, Alec, for sending that scene over and all of my other patrons that submitted scenes. I'll see you next time.